very soon in the next couple of minutes. And uh, with a very uh, casual procedure, Lydie, I'll be chatting with you uh, just for 10, 15 minutes or so, and I'll hand to Prakash. And then we let our members join us to bring you their questions. Uh, let's continue Terrific. So yeah, and, and no hurry. I, I, I always wait like five minutes on my classes until everybody gets there. But whenever you guys want to start, I'm ready. I can turn my, I can stop listening too if you want to talk about me behind my back. If we want to talk about you, <laughs> we don't want to okay, do okay. that. Uh, so we'll just, uh, people will start joining us in the next few minutes, just as we tick over onto four. Uh, there we are, a few more people coming along. And let's go to gallery. So I'll just say to everybody, um, as we come close to four and as everybody is starting to join us, if you want to put the view on to gallery view so that you can see everybody else who's joining us. If you have the bandwidth, if you want to turn on your video so that we can see your lovely faces, it's great to see the people who have joined us. And we've got people joining as we tick over to four o'clock. Here we go, super. Did you develop this all on LinkedIn? Is that like it just grew organically from there? That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Lydie. Yeah, we've uh, been doing this for a year now and we started very soon after Nudgestock last year, Nudgestock 2020. And that's how we all came together. That's how I met Prakash chatting away alongside in the chat box during Nudge Shock 2020. Okay. So as we just tick over four o'clock, I'm going to welcome you all to Behavioral Science Club. You're all very welcome today. I'm just glad to be here because I've been having my drive dug up and we've had the water punctured. Then we lost our uh, uh, Wi-Fi. So I'm just delighted that I can join the event today. And today, we are delighted to have join us Lydie Klotz. Oh, that was my Wi-Fi falling on the floor. Lydie Klotz. <laughs> and Lydie is a professor of engineering at the University of Virginia. And he's also a designer. And what you may not know about Lydie is that before, he both designed schools and was a professional soccer player. And uh, Subtract is his book, his new book out, and it's really for whenever we are designing and problem solving. And Lydie tells us that our minds tend to add before taking away. And interestingly, in uh, Twitter, Lydie, I saw that you'd shared a great projection picture of when uh, Champs-Élysées in Paris, what it would look like without cars. And I thought, now that's a real life example of taking away, taking away the cars. Um, so maybe to start with Lydie, as people are joining us here now, you could just for, you know, we'll presume people haven't read your book. Why don't you just give us a little outline of what the premise of the book is? Yeah, um, and I think, you know, the first thing is that, yes, it's fundamentally about design, but the way that I view design and the way that the, the book views design is something that everybody does. It's anytime we change something from how it is to, to how we want it to be. And that is, um, you know, where the book, that's where subtraction fits in, right? Subtraction is this basic way to change things from how they are to how we want them to be. And the book talks about why we don't use it as as much as we could um and you know so the book starts out with our scientific research which recently made the cover of nature which was amazing it was like a week before the book came out we we're on the cover of nature with our research showing that people systematically overlook subtraction so i think we'll 
I'd likely talk more about that, but you know, as an overview of the book, that's kind of where it kicks off. And that's what makes the book unique because one of the things, because nobody else knows that <laughs> and knew that at the time. And, um, and everything builds from there. So after, after we systematically don't think of subtraction, so systematically when we, you know, this isn't a matter of, oh, we think about what could I take away and it, then we're loss averse, so we don't take it away. This is like, we don't even think about it in the first place. Um, but then there are also a lot of reasons why when we do think about taking away, like the champs de example, right? I'm sure, you know, urban planners have, have known that that's a good way to improve certain roads for a long time. Um, but there are kind of fundamental barriers to taking away, like one being that it's hard to show competence by taking away, for example, right? Like one of the things we want to do as, as humans is, uh, is show that we can effectively interact with our world. And when you take something away, whether it's, um, you know, uh, a lane on a highway, or whether it's the 10 paid, the, you know, the 10 paragraphs that you wrote in your report that uh, you want people to see that you wrote, but don't actually add anything to the report, report um, that kind of is, a, is hard to do for a variety of reasons. So the first part of the book kind of builds up this why adding is happening. And then of course, you know, the last piece in that puzzle is the kind of economic and social forces that, um, that pull us to add. And then the second half of the book is like, okay, now that we know this stuff, now that we know the science, what are the science informed ways that we can become better at using subtraction um, and, you know, not just because, you know, I don't think subtracting is better uh, except in the fact that it's kind of underused, which might make it a little bit better, but just using more of our options as we try to change things from how they are to how we want them to be. So the book, you know, starts with our own basic research um, and then kind of builds from the science of understanding why why this is happening uh, and then uses that science to kind of come to some some practical tips but it's not like a, a here's the 10 steps to subtract it's more like here's this new here's the framework here's this way of looking at the world that will hopefully help you thinking about subtracting more often and so you know one thing there's all these books like Marie Kondo obviously um, Cal Newport uh, you know anybody who's kind of espousing minimalism that are really good for talking about it in specific contexts so Kondo's like hey here's how you subtract to make your closet better Cal Newport's like here here's how you subtract to make your digital life better um, and I hope that this book gives you a lens for subtracting um, in ways that I could never imagine, right? Uh, I can't prescribe a way for you to subtract in a, if you're a coder, for example, I, you know, I know that subtracting is valuable there, but I don't know all the ways that it can be valuable, but I hope that the, the book provides a lens that helps people use it in a lot of different contexts. And I think, you know, the feedback that I've been getting from talking to people, and that's why I love, absolutely love, love, love doing events like this is, uh, it, it seems to be doing that because, you know, some of the best feedback I get is like, hey, Here's an example of this thing where where either we overlooked it the way you're describing it, or we kind of persisted to noticeable less, um, and and it's an example that's a, a powerful example of subtraction. So yeah, that's the that's the summary of the book. There's also a lot of stories of if you don't like uh, little kids, don't read it. <laughs> There's a lot of stories of my son, uh, but he's. Um, <laughs> I think they're I think they're all useful. I just use him as an example when I need an example of, of humans doing things. Um, so anyway, there's a that's the summary. And that's woven in stories of subtraction from all different areas of life. So again, kind of getting to this, yes, I'm an engineer. Yes, you know, I kind of came to the question from this view of like, why aren't there more road diets? But um, this applies across objects physical world, you know, from Legos to, to big things, ideas, you know, the thoughts that are in our head, and that might be the most relevant one for you all, right? It's like, how much time do we spend kind of adding to our mental models versus taking away from our mental models, things that uh, either aren't as useful, and then situations. So the situations is kind of the, how we, how we organize our lives. So I try to sprinkle examples from all of those from kind of like everyday people, and then also from, you know, subtracting exemplars, whether they're Bruce Springsteen or, um, you know, some famous designer or some unfamous designer who should be famous. That's great. Thanks so much, Lydie. And what I love about talking to people 
about their books or about the specialist subject is that so quickly you find oh everything's connected. And I'm just reading at the moment uh, a, a completely unconnected book, <laughs> The Power of Ignorance by Dave Trott. And this cool. is just uh, this is just whilst I was waiting to join you today. And of course, it says any fool can make it complicated. <laughs> and the, the payoff line at the end is. Dr. Richard Cash says it really is much harder to make something simple than it is to make it complicated. And I just thought of you straight away. And, you know, so I thought that was great. You know, everything is connected. But how does somebody who's working in engineering, how did that overlap with the behavioral science way of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I've, I do engineering and design. I think, you know, the, so one of the, big social motivations for me is climate change and our environmental problems. And so, you know, these, these road diets, you know, pocket parks, even passive houses. So like these houses that don't have HVAC systems and use way less energy and are still comfortable. I've always been interested in those things. And um, uh, number one, they're kind of subtractive, but number two, they're possible from an engineering standpoint. And so I, I just saw all these examples of like, hey, the issue here is not that we don't have the technology to do better with climate change. Of course, you know, more in advancing technology is great um, and needs to be part of the solution. But a lot of the problem is just kind of adoption of the things that we have. And there's a lot of people who are looking at like, oh, here's how here's how we can get more people to like flip the light switch off, right? You see the stickers on the light switch, hey, you know, turn this off. And that's great. But it's like, what about the person who designed the lighting system, uh, you know, that that made it, you know, uh, incandescent bulbs and, you know, all artificial light when you could have had a natural lighting that didn't take any energy. Um, so I got interested in like, okay, what's the behavioral science of the designers that way? And that was about, you know, kind of really early when I was doing my PhD. Um, and then I've just been kind of pursuing behavioral science since then first kind of in a nudgy way, right? So it's like, okay, what are the, what's the choice architecture we can put into design processes to make people come up with more sustainable designs. But then and this is awesome because this is actually a group I can talk about this stuff with. I like this would be an hour long conversation having to lay all the groundwork to bring other people up to speed on this. But anyway, so first on the nudgy stuff, but then on like the fundamental, what is, you know, the behavioral science of design, right? Not just like taking this behavioral science and applying it to design, but what is the behavioral science of design? And if, if you think of design as like changing things from how they are to how they want, how we want them to be, arguably the most fundamental question is, you know, when we encounter the situation, what do we think of doing, you know, adding um, and subtracting? And we found that, you know, just by studying this very fundamental question that happens all the time, um, that there's like this huge systematic bias towards towards adding. Um, so that's kind of the, my intellectual trajectory, but also like brings right to the, to where the, where the book is. Um, and, um, and what I'm most excited about now, because I think like, kind of, as a scientist or researcher, I think, you know, understanding these kind of fundamental uh, behaviors is, is really, really exciting, <laughs> really exciting to find something and, and really relevant across a lot of, a lot of different contexts. That's great. Yeah, Lady, we're really interested in design. And one of our first uh, guests when we set up was uh, Amy Booker with her uh, book Engaged on Design. So it's something we've talked about before. And do you think that, I mean, often it's asking the right question. Do you think that engineers are naturally curious uh, people who ask questions anyway? Uh... Yes and no. <laughs> well, so yes, I think we're naturally curious people who ask questions and want to make things better. But uh, the right questions, I think we, um, you know, not intentionally, but we can be led to not ask the right questions, right? So engineering, it's uh, one, I, I have an appointment in architecture too, uh, and I'm trained as an engineer, but I get to see how architects think about things. And engineers are very much like, give me the thing, right? Give me the situation. Uh, 
and I will try to solve it. And we, we never, you know, if the situation is like, here's how you, we need to figure out how to bomb this other country. Engineers are like, okay, great. I'm going to figure it out. And, uh, but, and never kind of take a step back and say, oh, well, dude, do you want to bomb the other country? Like we don't see that as part of our scope. And I mean, that's a, a kind of outlandish example, but I think it's the same thing when you're thinking about like the, the roads, for example, you know, so engineers, if you're given a, a plan of a city, we often see it as like, okay, what, what roads do you want to build? We don't see it as our role to think about, well, you know, taking roads away, that's not an engineering thing. So we shouldn't do that. So I think we're very curious and very interested in applying science to make the world a better place. But I think part of the, the problem is that we kind of, we definitely start with the situation and don't kind of think about how we might change the situation itself or ask a different question as you put it louise i think that's often the hardest thing to do isn't it lady we've all got our way of thinking and uh, as you're saying the subtraction peeling back asking the why the why and the why five times why yeah. you know it's that's sometimes the only way to get back to to the groundwork to remove your own bias from it. Well, that's a fantastic introduction. Thank you so much, Lydie. And I'm going to now hand over to Prakash for a chat with you, and then we'll be turning to our members for their questions. Prakash. Terrific. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, Lydie, thank you so much for joining us. We know you have a busy schedule. Uh, we appreciate you coming down uh, here to talk with us. And for people who have just about joined us, people who are joining in right now for the first time, please put your cameras on. Uh, this is the club, which means you have to make new friends. The rules are very simple. You put your cameras on, you go down to a gallery mode, start looking at people, their reactions. You pick up the ones you like, you ping them and say, hey, this is me, this is my LinkedIn, my Twitter, let's connect, right? So we have over the last one year, lady, we are one year old uh, uh, at this point of time. Um, I Happy think birthday. just about 12, thank you, just about 12 uh, months right now, right now almost. So we have made new friends. So please, uh, people have joined us for the first time across across different countries of the world. Do that, start pinning each other. Uh, like just as you were joining in, uh, Louis was asking me, how do, how do they find, subtract uh, your book and about you? And uh, the story was, uh, it was a particular week when we had a particular client who came down to us and they wanted to add a particular feature, which they felt is gonna get parents to bond with their kids. It was an ed tech product, an education product. And if you look at service, parents were saying, I want to spend some more time with my child to teach him or her. So it was that survey, that idea, which was you know, telling my client that we should add up a feature to the product. Uh, later, as we deep dive, we realized that the parents tell you that because that's the right thing to say. It's desirability bias. I'm a good parent. Of course, I want to, you know, I wish I could spend some time. In reality, they want to get their wine and watch Netflix, right? <laughs> so <laughs> once we got to that, um, we had to explain to the client saying, I think we should not add. And I was looking for a word, a vocab, which could kind of convey this concept of not adding. And um, it was not there in my vocabulary. And it was that week that I discovered your book. And then I went down with your book and with this whole idea saying, we should look at subtract as a philosophy. Why subtract itself can be powerful. Louis, that was a story. Thank you so much, uh, Lady, for making my client, uh, making my client think I'm a smart man. <laughs> so the quick question here is, when we are looking at more, is it a, is it a problem of evolutionary biology? Or is it a problem uh, coming from the fact that we as humans are interacting in larger systems where the incentives are designed in such a way that the visual of adding makes people think I'm doing more. Mm -hmm. like, There's a reason we all celebrate the fireman as the hero, not the guy who's getting a fire drill done. Everybody hates him, but the fireman is a celebrated one. So which one is it or is it a mix of, of both, Lady? Yeah, it's a mix of both. And your house sounds like mine, Prakash, with the kids running around. So, um, yeah, <laughs> the uh, um, and the way the book is structured, I mean, so the first chapter talks about our our basic research that was on the cover of Nature, and then the the second chapter is kind of the biological evolutionary 
reasons for this or um and you know obviously our, our acquisitiveness right this thing that's linked very closely to just our our desire to to eat right um and to, you know that's helped us pass down our genes for a long time is to get food and to to stockpile things um and then another surprising biological one that i think ties into the kind of adding stuff to apps and adding to roads and stuff is like competence right so this desire to show that we can effectively interact with the world. And I talk in the book about bowerbirds, um, you know, they build these ceremonial nests and the whole purpose of the nest is just to show that the, the, the male who built the nest is good at interacting with the world. I mean, once the females decide which male to mate with based on the nests, the females go build a nest for shelter, right? So we have this desire to show that we can impact the world. And it's easier to do that by adding, right? You know, when you take something off of an app or when you don't add something to an app, it's like, how do you justify your existence as a, as a designer? How do you show your competence? Um, and there's, there's ways to do that. Again, that's where it's like, it's helpful to understand the science of why it's hard um, so that we can figure out conscious ways to do it. And of course, like biology is not an excuse, right? It's just, this is a, a force that's pulling us in this direction. It's not like we act on all of our biological instincts all the time, right? Um, but then the, the culture piece is interesting and it's great having this global audience. I'd be, um, you know, maybe that is something that'll come up in the discussion. We didn't find any evidence in our studies. Um, you know, we used a lot of studies with Americans uh, and of all different ages, but of course, America is a melting pot uh, that has, you know, certainly interdependent and independent cultures represented. Uh, and then we also did studies in Japan and Germany to, you know, see if there were differences and there weren't any major differences across the, the cultures that we studied. I think, you know, one of the things we want to look at is a more in-depth culture study, because I imagine there will be like smaller differences, but we didn't find that like, oh, the people in Germany, the Germans, we, <laughs> our German friends were like, Germans are going to be good at this. Germans are totally rational. They're not going to miss any subtractions. And um, we didn't find any evidence that Germans don't overlook subtraction. Uh, so, but then there's there, I think there are some interesting cultural questions about interdependence and independence, but fundamentally, like as cultures and as civilizations, I mean, the reason we're here is because our cultures expanded and added, right? I mean, we are a product of the cultures that kind of said, hey, we're gonna become bigger and we're gonna spread out. Um, also, one of the things that's really interesting if you look at like the anthropology and what the historians are saying is this role of monumental architecture at the genesis of cultures. And so this very like physical kind of adding was essential to the development of civilization, basically building big things is what helped people come together, right? The, the need to build big things required people to live in bigger communities. And so like adding is there at the genesis of civilization, whether it's an Eastern culture, Western culture, interdependent, independent, um, we all kind of share that same heritage. And then of course the, 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 the economic and uh, kind of socioeconomic incentives, right? You know, as long as we're measuring GDP as the success of a, of a, our economic success, then that obviously advantages adding, right? If you add a prison, it goes into a, a net positive in the GDP, even though that's like not necessarily a, a good thing. If you spend more money to add a highway, even though kind of subtracting lanes would have been better, that goes, that increases GDP. So, and that, that those kind of metrics go, go all the way down, right? If I think about myself as a, um, you know, if I, if my friends who are doing consulting engineering, for example, oftentimes their pay is based on how much the thing that they create costs. So if you, you can subtract a lane from a highway, you can't justify as much pay as if you add a whole highway, even though maybe the design effort is about the same. So there's, yes, the answer to your question is all of these things play a role, you know, biological, cultural, economic, um, but none of them are, are insurmountable. And I think like understanding how they play a role in our adding is one of the best ways to kind of help, um, help find more of the options that we've been missing. Uh, thank you for that uh, nuanced multi-layered answer, Lady. Uh, I can see the chat uh, box is livening up with, with questions, guys. Please put up your questions. Um, and I can see discussions around GDP, SPI, all of that. Uh, which also means I think we just switch to a Q and A. 
not not really uh, you know me hog the the time out here so let me bring up a last question even though i have a lot more uh, so one thing is clear is you are not advocating subtract is the way i mean in, in today's world the nuance is lost when someone suggests something but oh light is now saying don't add just subtract i think that's not what you're saying you're saying you need the balance you need both of it why are we not paying as much attention to subtract as a philosophy and addition has a point like you're telling with the monuments out there they do help us go towards a direction so uh, how do we practice subtraction and i think let's me let's make it a personal life there's so much of information all the time all the time through twitter through your linkedin through your facebook your algorithm is out there to get you right all of them and how do we practice subtract what is it doing to us all this amount of information and is there a practical tip we can use slightly and then we switch to the q and a's yeah, so I'll give one general tip and one practical tip. I mean, the general tip, yeah, I'm so glad, Prakash, you headed off the question of like, well, there, there's, there's this highway in my city that I don't think we should subtract. <laughs> yeah, so I add and subtract. I mean, we need to shift our mindset from thinking, you know, one of the damaging things that's happening here is we pro pro position these things as opposites, right? And when you position things as opposites, that can often be helpful because if one thing is true, then the other thing is not true. Um, and that helps with scientific reasoning, but it's not helpful when the things aren't actually opposites. And what we're talking about here is complementary approaches to making change. If adding has been good, we, sh we shouldn't think, oh, subtraction must be bad. We should think, oh, well, adding made things better. I wonder if subtracting is gonna make things better and vice versa, right? If subtracting made things better, I wonder if like adding would make things better. So kind of shifting that, that's the general tip, right? Shifting that mindset from add or subtract, right? How many times do we position these things as opposites um, to add and subtract? Um, and then the, uh, the specific one, like with information, I think is just, um, well, maybe it's not super specific, but it, it's it's thinking about how do you filter and and get rid of the amount of information that's coming into your life. And so for me, that's meant um, like email. Uh, I've gone down to okay, just check email twice a day. Um, force yourself to do that, and that's a you know subtractive way of of dealing with information. And what's interesting about that is that it's kind of led to cascades uh, as I think of them, like subtracting cascades where part of the reason I was getting so many emails is because I was sending a lot of emails, right? It's like, if I only check email twice a day and limit the amount of time, I'm less likely to send this like, you know, email to my 12 grad students that's, you know, marginally useful, but not useful enough to have them all read, all think about for 30 minutes and then respond to with 12 more emails for me. So um, I think it's led to these kind of subtraction cascades where uh, I've got, I've received less emails and then people in, in my network have um, obviously received less emails. And I think that works for all kinds of information. I mean, another one, like things like this are amazing, right? And so again, like it's add and subtract. If we can Zoom with people from all over the world and talk about <laughs> an idea that we all care about, I mean, how amazing is that? But um, but at the same time, there's a tendency, like what I found myself doing before writing the book, I would listen to a podcast while running on the treadmill at the gym, while watching the news, trying to like check all these boxes at the same time. And, you know, maybe that's good for some people, but it, like my running time had been my time to kind of synthesize and to think, okay, well, here's the stuff that's important. Here's the stuff that's not important. Here's the stuff that's actually like wrong that I used to think. And so kind of thinking about, you know, being intentional about what information you're bringing in and setting up situations where you can give yourself time to distill. I mean, one of my favorite subtracting quotes, and I see some, some of my favorites and some new ones popping up in the chat there. And, and then Louise gave me one that, uh, but, um, is, is Lao, one that gets attributed to Lao Tzu anyway, which is, you know, to gain knowledge, add things every day, to gain wisdom, subtract things every day. And that running time was my, my wisdom gaining time. Um, and that's a quote that's two and a half millennia old. So this notion of like having more uh, uh, more information than to kind of time to process is a, isn't as new as, uh, as we might think. Uh, and and we're still not dealing with it as evidenced by the fact that the quote still resonates after two and a half millennia. 
Thank you so much, much Lady. Are we going to questions, Prakash? Yes, please. Uh, let's do it. It's refreshing in a world where everybody's trying to you know, get you to do a lot of things. The whole idea of productivity is around being 2,000 things into shorter amount of time. Uh, it's a nice uh, refreshing thought to say. I think the approach is to see what you really need to do and remove away, subtract away the rest. Louise, I, I leave the moderation in your capable hands. A lot of questions out here, all yours. Thanks so much, Prakash. And I love that we're talking about in the same conversation, super highways and emails. We're going just from <laughs> one extreme to the next. Um, that was fantastic. Um, right back, there's loads of chat going on. Right back at the start of the chat, um, Kathleen, you were saying that today you have a question for Lydie. Would you like to join us? Oh, yes. Well, it's it's more comments, series of comments. I really enjoyed the book and I um, praise you and your editor for getting it to the essence. And um, that was one of the comments I was my master's is in paleoanthropology. And when I did my research and I wrote it, I took it into my advisor. I don't have any paper here. We'll grab this anyway. And he went, it's not long enough. And I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> so I was forced to add a bunch of extraneous stuff until it got to his desired length. Um, yeah. And another thing is I am, I'm also have a doctorate in biological anthropology. So I do have a few issues with you on a couple of things, but I'm not going to get into that. What I, I would love to, to uh, send me an email with the issues because I, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I wanted to talk about were foragers because that's what we're adapted to be. We spent millions of years being foragers and what for, most foragers do is they stay in one place for a little bit of time and then they move on somewhere else. And so when you move, you can't, things collect. When you stay in one place, things collect. But when you move, you have to get rid of stuff. You have to get down to the essence of what you really need to take with you. I have moved 33 times in my life. When Origin. I was younger, half of them when I was a child, half of them as an adult. When I was younger, I seriously considered, I mean, as a young adult, lightweight furniture, foldable furniture, what I could leave, what I could take because I was doing all the packing and everything myself. And so, but another thing is I, I really, I love reading. I've read thousands of books, <laughs> literally, <laughs> but I set myself, I try and, and find an apartment or a home near a library because books are heavy. You can't move books. And, but now I have lived 14 years in this one place and I have tons of stuff and I really don't want to move again <laughs> because things collect. And I think that's our, our way of understanding addition is it is part of who we are because when you sit in one place, things collect. If we were all moving like foragers, we wouldn't have a problem with subtraction because it's just, you can only take what you can carry with you. And so there is, I think that is kind of the mindset. Also foragers, the ones that have not been pushed out of their traditional homelands are very happy and do not want to change the way they live. They are comfortable with the amount of stuff they don't have, I guess you could say. So I think that's kind of, Priyanka made a comment earlier on in the chat about, um, being depressed and that's why we collect stuff. And maybe that is, maybe it is to fill a void, but that we are not actually moving around the environment. We are designed to walk a lot. Mm -hmm. If you don't walk a lot, you're not healthy or you running on the treadmill, but really we're walk walking, we're moving. We have changed in the last, I'd say maybe 5,000 years. We have changed from what we are adapted to, to what we are doing now which has made the world very interesting and exciting. But <laughs> that's why we end up with so much addition, I think. 
So all yeah. of you move 33 times and you'll understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do, I, I think it's an important to note that um, there are certainly pro subtraction forces. And that's one that I give a nod to in the book, at least in the um, kind of evolutionary chapter. It's like, yeah, we were wired to acquire in, in certain ways, but we do, we have evolved from those, you know, people that did not had to carry all their stuff everywhere with them. Right. And so like, we can't excuse our modern hoarding based on the behavior of, of hunter gatherers. Although, um, so anyway, the, uh, I think that, uh, all true and a good point that um, all there are forces that kind of should be helping us subtract too. Yeah, but collecting yeah. collecting is what we do. You were right. Co you want to you want to have the food. You want to feed your kids. You want to do this. So collecting is normal, but mm -hmm. moving is also normal. If so you it's go the lack the of moving. There's a great. Um, there's a great skit by George Carlin. Uh, he, he says that your house is just the lid for your stuff, basically. And if you're a George, I mean, there's lots of swear words in it and stuff. So don't watch it if you don't like that. But if you like George Carlin, Google George Carlin house lid. Uh, and he talks about this in a comedy, from a comedy perspective. Thanks, Kathleen. Great reference. Thanks, Lydie. And uh, quite a big question here from uh, Jaffer. Would you like to join us, Jeff Sag, with your question? Hey, Louis, thank you for picking. Uh, well, I've already asked two questions in the chat, but I think this one might be more interesting. Uh, can you hear me all right? We can. Okay, cool. So um, I want to take this discussion to beliefs, right? And, and as humans, I think many of us have this tendency to oversimplify things. And in that sense, uh, we check out a lot of uh, information that might be uh, pertinent to something, but we keep uh, very few beliefs and we stick to them, right? And in a sense, there's a lot of biases around that also. And in that sense, there's an indirect subtraction, right? That we're picking only the beliefs that we are comfortable with or we confirm with. And uh, uh, and as we progress and we see more and more information, uh, and we when we see a different information, which is very different from our belief, there's a lot of dissonance, right? And and the initial tendency is not to add, uh, but to protect your uh, already existing belief, right? Uh, and there, I, it seems like it, there is already a ten tendency to subtract. Uh, I just want to hear from you what you think in terms of uh, belief perception is, uh, you know, adding um, and uh, uh, updating your beliefs. That's me. Yeah, I would. I mean, I don't know if this is exactly what's going on there, obviously, because every situation is different, but I think it does bring up a point that, I mean, there are, you know, kind of three basic options, right? One is adding, one is subtracting, and one is not doing anything. And I think that the belief one is less about, I think it's more like not doing anything, right? It's like people are just closed off to any new belief that, um, I mean, so for me, it's, you know, if somebody's going to be like, okay, here's like, 10 ways of looking at the world. And I'm really open to looking at all of them. I mean, that's a matter of, of adding. And then, I mean, I, that would be less of a problem if people like added and then, you know, stripped down and said, okay, well, here are the three beliefs that after considering these 10, you know, these are the three that I'm kind of aligned with. But I mean, I, so two things there. I mean, one, I, in my view, I think that's kind of like this this notion of lazy less, right? Where um, I talk about it in the book is like, okay, one way to get to less is just to not do anything. And I think that's part of the reason that, well, that's um, that's not what we're talking about here, right? And then subtracting is this active thing that actually requires more work. It requires adding, you know, it requires adding these new beliefs and then it requires stripping away, you know, what, what doesn't make sense anymore now that you've added these these new beliefs. Um, so yeah, I think uh, a couple of things there. Plus it's just, you know, again, I'm agnostic on adding and subtracting. I think, you know, there are certainly situations where what's needed to happen is that you add more ideas and add more more beliefs. Um, it's not that subtracting is always the right answer. I don't know, does that, what do you think about that, Jafar? Jafar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, makes sense. Uh, and, and I agree, it's, it's different subtracting. And then, so when I meant uh, subtracting, what I meant is we're indirectly subtracting because uh, we might not necessarily have added a lot of beliefs in our head, but we're processing that there are 10 other beliefs 
uh, that are currently I don't hold, but I, in my concentration, right, in my set. And uh, what I'm doing there is very non-consciously removing them. And I'm much comfortable having one or two beliefs that I'm sticking to, right? And I understand yeah. that's a little different from subtracting, but I just meant that we very naturally do some, and that's related to a lot of oversimplification in our lives, right? Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, I like subtracting away nuance is not what we need to do in most cases, right? And th this is, I mean, this is chapter eight in the book, the, the last chapter. I mean, I, I put, it's, <laughs> I conclude with a chapter on what this means for climate change and then what it means for our thinking. Like, and in that, I think that our thinking is even more important than this like massive global issue. And one of the things, you know, this isn't, just beliefs but it's like education scholars have studied a long time like how do you change the mindsets that people bring in like right because like you can't it makes sense right you, if you're trying to scaffold knowledge onto what people already think the first thing you want to do is identify misconceptions that people have so kids will come with different science misconceptions right this is like the sun orbits around the earth or something like that or the orbits are circular is more uh more one but um scientists have or the the education researchers studied that for a long time and they're like how do we subtract misconceptions how do we get rid of these things and it they gave up i mean they said it's impossible like it, you know the it's it's so hard to get people to get rid of even wrong misconceptions that the best hope we can have is to try to kind of like adapt to what's there so i mean and this isn't like a throw your hands up in the air but it is it's acknowledgement that this is a hard problem i mean it's a one of the examples I use in the book is my son, you know, he, he believes in Santa Claus, he's six, and um, he got, he likes Legos, uh, and he got a Lego set for Christmas, and he's like, what's going on here? I mean, I thought, you know, Santa just has wood workshop at the North Pole, and I was like, oh, no. so I thought really quickly, and I said, oh, well, well, Santa for this kind of stuff, he, he works with Amazon, he works directly with Amazon on this. And my son's like, all right, great, you know, because this like, this aligned with his prior beliefs. So it's like a lot easier. What happened there is like he adapted his prior beliefs to accommodate the new information. And that's a lot. That's what we normally do. One thing that, um, that is helpful to kind of help people subtract misconceptions is analogies. So if you can draw an analogy, between the new thing and something that they already know, then instead of like the new thing fighting against the misconceptions, you've got the new thing plus the analogy fighting against the misconceptions and you've got a little bit better chance, but it's hard. I mean, it's why you asked the question, right? This is like, yeah, it's hard and it's critical. Yeah, thanks lady. And I really want to read your book, but it's super expensive in India. I don't know why, but uh, looking is it really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just wait. I'm sure the price will come down. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. How much is it in India? Question, like more than uh more than regular books? I could. It's around twenty pounds, I think, if I'm not wrong. It's close to. Okay. 20. Yeah. Yeah. Is there an audio book there yet? Not yet. I was. I looked for it as well because I have subscription in Audible, but not yet. Yeah. So. Oh well, there's def. I mean, there's an Audible book, and I, I don't know why that wouldn't be available in oh. India. I'll have. To, I'll shoot my publisher an email. I. I mean. I listened to the audiobook recently and I quite uh quite enjoyed it. I thought the narrator did a really good job. Um so <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. A great question. And um now uh Arvind, there's been quite a lot of chat from you today. And uh right back at the start, you were asking a question about flow state. Would you like to put that to Lydie? Yeah, so uh you know, Professor Klotz and me had corresponded once over email because, you know, I really wanted to read the original paper, uh, which he was kind enough to share. Uh, and for me, Ezra was the protagonist of this textbook because I sort of went through the entire book and I'm, you know, sort of three fourths done with the book and it's quite heavy, you know, and I really need time to sort of digest and sort of, you know, rumble through whatever is the takeaway. Um, so, while the book starts off with, you know, the experiments that you guys, you and, you know, Gabe and Ben and Andy and all these guys did. Uh, so the first question I had was the cultural bias, right? Because just like your German friend and, you know, the Japanese thing, because um, I, I sort of had the belief that people who, at least the Southeast Asian crowd, um, people who are sort of, aware of the Kaizen set of 
principles or mm-hmm. you know the indian set of jugaad who mm-hmm. have the sort of constraints would inevitably have this innate sense of subtracting you know something mm-hmm. is not working out just chuck it out i mean there's no some cost fallacy per se um but then you know after a couple of chapters you know you come across this anecdote about the german friend and the japanese and i'm like hmm, okay so maybe not cultural but what about positional bias right so this is one of the reasons as to why i want to really you know sort of replicate the experiment and see if there are things and uh, it sort of holds true uh, but uh, my question was primarily um, drawn from the conversation you had with uh, professor layman over on uh, too lazy to read the paper yeah uh, yeah uh, it was fun fun conversation right and it didn't feel like and i was just read, you know listening to it while i was boarding my flight in the morning um and my question was the fact that you know you sort of sub, you start automatically subtracting when you sort of reach a plateau um you know so you sort of i sort of you know buy into the argument and the premise that you know adding signals competence right so you keep adding and it sort of signals that you know i know what i'm doing blah 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 but then you hit a plateau whether it's an athlete and given your own you know soccer history uh, you sort of hit a plateau and that's when you sort of realize that maybe this is not working or this is too much of an effort maybe i should redirect my energies and sort of subtract the sort of activity that i'm doing uh and that usually happens and because i'm just coming off my you know uh, sort of sabbatical as a student uh mid career shift uh and i found that that you know i've started trying you know uh, time manage and sort of make note of where i'm spending how much time or at least when i used to commute to school from wherever i was staying you know i used to okay it's taken me 20 minutes maybe i can shave like 5 minutes you know um reach leave a bit early you know have my coffee and my smoke and then you know sort of leave for school and that's the sort of thing where you sort of start subtracting and i realized that the more time i started spending on you know focusing as to how i can carve things off my schedule is automatically i used to get into the flow state you know yeah. i'm sort of priming myself into the efficient Uh, sort of space so i wanted to understand saying is this like a quick hack like if i just start approaching a problem or my schedule per se uh and say okay this is what is given to me let me see what out what all i can you know knock off um would that lead um to a lot more elevated flow state to speak uh and as a you know counter question is the fact that you know i sort of lost the rung but yeah you can sort of answer this and i'll probably you know remember what i was talking about yeah i i like both of those questions and both i mean i touch on both in the book but um i've a thought more about them since writing too and i was so the i wrote a piece um on uh i'll try to send a link to it but if you google anderson horowitz has this future um op-ed column that, and it's about adding and subtracting and like are we at like a historical moment where you talk about as we've added stuff then subtraction becomes more viable right and it's like have we reached this point where it's like yeah adding when you don't have when you're um kind of roaming around everywhere like adding is the <laughs> right option but have we like developed to a point where there's just like more subtractive options and i mean that's obviously there's not a nature paper on that because that's more speculative but um so i think there's that like are we at this moment i think whether or not we're at this moment the fact that people are overlooking something right means that it's there's untapped potential there right if if everybody else isn't thinking of this if you're one of the people who's able to think of it it means that there's potential i mean that's how prakash you know thought of this idea that made him look smart to his client but um the flow state one i think is really interesting and one of the there's a quote um by stephen king who's a yeah a writer um he says to write is something to edit is divine um and i think you know so flow states for those aren't familiar i mean mahali skidis mahali his uh he's written a definitive book on this and he argues that it's the kind of psychology of optimal experience and and basically what what's happening in a flow state is that there's 
close alignment between like your ability and the task. Um, so you're, you're being pushed, but not too much, uh, right? So it's like, you don't get in a flow state if you throw like a five, if I go into a, um, well, if, if, a, if a high school soccer player goes into a professional soccer game, they're not gonna be in a flow state. They're overwhelmed, the task is too hard. But if a, uh, um, if a high school player like kind of plays in a high school game, then that can be a really good flow state because it's like the challenge matches your ability. And I think that, yeah, like you know, to, to use the writing example, I mean, if you've got a blank piece of paper and now you need to create something, right? That's writer's block um, if, you know, in the worst case. Uh, and so sometimes there can be this misalignment between like the challenge and the ability that you have. But when you're subtracting, it's like everything you need is right there in front of you, right? You've got the situation, you've got the possibilities of what can be subtracted as long as you can see the situation. And so, yeah, that's where I think like, it can kind of lead to these flow states because it's challenging, but the, it's not impossible. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, that's my argument for like it kind of bringing in flow states. And I, I mean, again, I, I think it's hard to say that like all subtracting would bring flow states, but certainly editing for me brings a, a flow state. And um, because I think that, again, it's like, it's challenging, but now it's a, it's a puzzle that I can kind of figure out or continue to, improve upon because the um all the words are right there in front of me and i'm just trying to figure out which ones to subtract does that make sense arvind yeah it does yeah. Uh, so I, I would probably be a bit of a nuisance and probably send you a couple of mails you know and just to uh, not just a nuisance. Because, you know you, you're you're sort of history sort of mirrors mine and the sort of um challenges that you sort of Based and trying to articulate where Gabe stepped in and said, you know, oh, subtracting is what you're talking about, while yeah. you were probably, you know, using a different sort of language, is the same sort of issues I'm sort of facing with, you know, my professors. And so probably I will, you know, sort of chew away your ears a bit, if you don't mind. Sure. It's all about getting on the same page about the ideas. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Arvind. Um, now I'd like to bring in uh, Binit. Do you remember your question right back at the start, Binit? <laughs> you asked a super question about creating an illusion. Would you like to put that to Lady? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Lady. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I'm a marketeer, uh, handle a brand in India. Uh, so my question is uh, around. Um, uh, the challenge which I'm facing right now. So I'm one of the brands in an organization which has got 10, 10 more brands. And uh, my CEO is more interested in launching more brands. So, so the idea is that uh, how will, uh, you know, uh, I, and obviously keeping the authority in also mine, uh, will use an analogy to, you know, convince him that, you know, less is more. Uh, and, and it becomes very challenging at times because, uh, uh, as as human beings, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, conditioned to, you know, look for more choices and things like that. So I was looking for an example in which I can probably convince or probably give him a, you know, rationale uh, or whether, or whether uh, I can create an illusion of choice uh, and probably convince him that this is the right thing to do about, you know, uh, subtracting. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give you, I'll, I'll quickly give a, uh, you know, an example which I, or probably a hack which I've used. So I also deal with a lot of agencies and, you know, they come back with, you know, this is a consumer insight and that is a consumer insight. And many a times we say that, no, I don't think this is a consumer insight. This is a generic thing. Uh, so, and they, you know, argue back that saying that, no, this is a consumer insight. So I, I, I created a hack saying that, you know, uh, you know, what is a consumer insight? What kind of feeling is a consumer insight? When you walk into your, uh, you know, kitchen with a dim light and when you open the refrigerator, the lights comes out. And if you have that feeling, that is an insight. So that is the way I was able to convince people that, you know, this is what the analogy should be. So I was looking for something like that, you know, probably where I can convince that less is more to him. Yeah. Yeah, without him cutting your line, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, oh, good idea. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's like gets at the, it's certainly the competence thing, right? And a little bit of the, you know, displaying competence, but also like 
I'm sure there's an incentive as a, you know, like I, I think about my Dean, uh, this seems like the equivalent here, right? And when my Dean came in, it's like, you got to do something, right? Because if you don't do something, you're seeing like, what's the point? Why, why do we have this person? And so his thing was like, we're going to condense the departments down from, from nine to five or whatever. So is there some way you can make, you know, you're, you're an existing thing, but is there a way that you can make him think that like you're new basically, right? And like reframe the language so that it's like, okay, this is his, uh, his or her, uh, I think you said his, but his, uh, his thing. Um, yeah, it's a hard one. I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, Bob Sutton, he wrote the no asshole rule. Um, he's a business scholar at Stanford, uh, and like a really interesting guy who does a lot of work with organizations. And he reached one of the highlights for me writing this book is like, he reached out to me through Adam Grant, which is like, I don't know either of these people and Bob Sutton's emailing Adam Grant to make an introduction to me. And I'm like, this is uh yeah, I would have answered an email from both of you guys. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but, but I, so I talked to Bob because he's really interested in like organizational friction and how to get rid of friction. Well, get rid of and add friction in organizations, depending on whether it's um, helpful or not. So there might be, he's got this friction project and they have all these business case studies. And I just can't think of one off the top of my head where like, it sounds like what you need is a, like, Hey, here's an, here's an example of this specific thing happening. So I would check out that friction project and see if they've got any cases where you can be like, Oh, AstraZeneca did this. And here's what happened. You can, um, you can be like that. Uh, all of my, all of my, um, things would be appeals to logic. I mean, you could show him the nature paper, right? And that, that might make him feel smart and give him the, uh, he can he can say that he's making his decisions based on a nature paper. And you could say that, uh, yeah, that the adding doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily make things better. I mean, it's a classic thing of prioritization, right? But I mean, it, and you see it everywhere. It's like, here's the, here's the change we're gonna make and it's like adding these new things and it just dilutes all of the efforts. Anyway, sorry not to have like a, straightforward answer i hope that the, the friction project helps and you'll figure it out just uh yeah, sure, 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 yeah. thanks thanks a lot thanks yeah. so much Bennett. thank you um Lashizar, would you like to ask your question that you asked early on are you still with us Lashizar? yeah i'm not quite yeah, sure whether if you were going in Lashizar, but you were looking to see whether there was a, a gender story here yeah, yeah. Uh, so the following question, uh, it's great that we have you uh, today with us, Lady. My name is Lachazar and I'm a researcher and a PhD candidate. I use behavioral biology and frameworks from it and uh, apply to marketing and advertising, just to give you some context. So I was wondering where the subtraction logic is most applicable to mar in marketing, in a marketing context. And the second question is, I was wondering uh, whether there are uh, fields and or subfields in subtraction logic where there are gender differences? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> great question. Um, I always like to, I mean, because engineering, one of the problems that we have as a field, at least in the United States, I know it's not like this in every country, um, is that there's like tremendous underrepresentation of women and racial and ethnic minorities. I mean, it's, we're like 20% women, to give you an example, which, you know, as a teacher, like the women are by far the <laughs> far and away the better students too. Um, so, uh, so I always like to find examples where it's like, oh look, women are better at this. Um, but we didn't we we looked at our we didn't set up our studies to test gender, but we did look at the the gender breakdown to see if there were any differences, and there weren't any substantial substantive differences. You know whether women were better than men, or even whether any like you know age groups were better than other age groups, for example, or cultures were better than others. Um, so yeah, uh, but I do think that that's a really interesting question. I don't think it'll change the the overall story that people systematically overlook it, but I do think that there will be differences that can help us learn like, okay, how to what degree is this just like innate, how much of it is trained into us in in various education systems? It would be really interesting to learn if like, I think engineers might be well, there's, you could have theories about whether like trained designers would be better at it or worse at it than other people. Maybe we've been conditioned to add through playing with Legos, or maybe we've been conditioned to think of more of our options when designing things. Um, I think the marketing, uh, 
the marketing stuff. Yeah. I, I think, uh, something that I saw come up in the chat, but, um, just recognizing that people struggle with this, right. There's this negative balance around subtracting, like you, pe people, when you, when that word, uh, valence is like the how people associate it do you think of it as positive negative thing um and subtracting has a negative valence as a word and you know only about 20 percent of words have a negative valence most are positive or neutral and so and then one of the problems i think with subtracting is that people conflate it with loss right so we're talking about subtracting to make things better but you know number one people think of subtracting as this negative thing and number two they can think of less as a loss and then then you're fighting you know loss aversion the endowment effect and you know all of Kahneman and Tversky's stuff uh and what we're talking about here shouldn't shouldn't trigger loss aversion because it's not it's not a loss it's a gain um uh so there's two things one is to get everybody in the world to read my book right that's going to change the balance around <laughs> around subtracting and see that it's like oh this is this joyful thing and in a lot of ways that's what marie kondo does right that's her genius is she's like hey this sparks joy um and so she's like changing the balance around subtracting physical stuff uh but then you know failing that until that happens recognizing that your customers are going to have this negative balance and so how can you frame things there's a lot of ways to describe subtractive things that don't require you to say subtract right and maybe not don't promote this loss aversion and that's the story i tell in the book about kate orff um this des brilliant designer who's done some amazing landscape uh designs but she she has this design that she did and a lot of it was subtracting she basically went into the city of lexington kentucky and like removed a lot of physical infrastructure but she doesn't say subtract in her design she's got four letters on there and or four major words on there and she uses clean carve and reveal which are all synonyms for subtraction but are much more positively balanced so i think like from what i know about marketing that's like if what you're trying to sell is a subtraction maybe don't call it a subtraction and maybe frame it, you know, kind of one of these other ways. But I think the the cultural and, and uh, distinctions between cultures and professions and, you know, age groups, that's a, that's what we're really excited to work on next. But I, I'm glad that Arvind is going to be doing some of the work for us and in, in finding out if this happens in, in his, his culture. Thank you. Thanks so much. Lester. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the time has just gone so quickly. I can't believe it. Can I quickly ask Nula to jump in with your question about the authorship? Because I want it to be answered. We're right <laughs> on the hour. So very quickly. Very quickly. OK, thanks, Louise. Uh, great book, Lydie. Uh, really brilliant idea. It, I... Oh, no. I think it reflects the typical consultant brainstorm session of, you know, start, stop, continue, and no one ever, ever says stop. So anyway, my question was pretty simple. You've got four authors uh, for the nature research, but the book has only got one, yourself. So how do the other researchers respond to the book? Professional envy is assumed. So did you find that it added or subtracted from your relationship? <laughs> well, the relationship's still going strong. I mean, I, I you know, consider them friends and, uh, they consider me friends i so i you'd have to ask them whether there's uh <laughs> but i think they would say the same thing um i think in the way it was set up it was very obvious from the start it wasn't this situation where it's like oh we have this paper and now somebody needs to write a book it was like i was writing the book while we were doing the research for mm -hmm. the paper so they they were seeing this all along that like hey we're doing our research and here i am off on the side doing 30 hours a week more work to kind of develop the book stuff and i I think that they they reinforced each other. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope there's not professional envy. I think, um, and quite frankly, I mean, the paper is done amazingly, right? And uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like getting, making sure that they uh, uh, got credit for doing the research. And the other thing, I mean, we're equal co-authors on the paper, but I mean, we've tried to in the, at least I've tried to in the paper kind of publicity take a step back and let Ben and Gabe be the ones who are doing the quote, you know, doing the quotes. And, you know, that's, you know, Gabe's the listed as the first author, even though we're all equal co-authors, but, you know, so sometimes it'll be like, okay, Gabe's the corresponding author. So she gets more of the attention for the paper. So I think, you know, that's helped balance it. It's, I think the, 
I think the takeaway would be that it's been, it's just been an amazing collaboration. I mean, these are really great friends and that we've been able to like have these conversations throughout the process. I mean, uh, and then it was funny, we got an email um, from a literary agent, uh, Gabe, Gabe and I did after the paper came out and she's like, you should write a book on this. And we sent her the book and said, it's written. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's where we're at, but it's a, it's a really good question. Did you have follow-up thoughts on that? Um, or no, I just wondered actually. I didn't know that the that the you so really you did the research to support the book, which I think is which I think is interesting. Yeah, I mean it's totally. Yeah. This was like I think part of the it's like part of the the book literally came out a week after the research, right? And so it's like we knew. I mean, you know how mm -hmm. research goes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you it's you know you've got something, and we we knew basically we had the the kind of first set of studies showing that people don't subtract. Um, I was like, oh, this is like, this is really interesting. And I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff that doesn't relate, doesn't even require the studies, but we knew we had enough with the studies to be like, okay, this is a cool book. And so basically as we were, um, as we were like halfway through the studies that we ended up putting in the paper, that was when the book kind of got under contract with the publisher and then where I was working away. And then like towards the end, I'm sitting there having to finalize the book being like, what can I, am I going to be able to put these studies in here and like reference the nature article? Um, because yeah, so it got really down to the wire there of, of like how that was going to go. And if, if anything, you know, the science was always the priority, always, always, always. And I think if, if the science hadn't come out in time, we would have just delayed the book until the science came out, but that's, yeah, that's how it kind of, they worked along in parallel. Yeah. And so that's, I think that also, I think it would be totally different if the, you know, the paper comes out and then we're sitting there as the four of us, like who wants to write a book? And, you know, the other thing that would help there is the other co-authors have absolutely no interest in writing a book. I mean, the agents calling Gabe, Gabe, write a book on the businessy aspects of this. And she's like, no, no, I don't want to do that. So, yeah. Thank Very you, good. Nula. Thank you. thank you so much, Nula. And thank you everybody who's joined us today. Uh, for this really great animated conversation with Lydie. There's been loads of chat at the side, uh, great questions, great conversation. And uh, it's just gone so quickly, uh, which is a good sign, Lydie. Um, so I'm just gonna hand back to Prakash to wrap up and thank you all for joining us again. Thank you, uh, Luis, uh, all the participants who asked their questions. Thank you so much. Um, Lainey, there's something about you because today I noticed, and we are here all the sessions, right? Uh, I know a lot of us opened ourselves, some part of ourselves to you. I don't know what is it about you. Uh, I noticed it about myself. I don't talk about work <laughs> when I'm here. I noticed a couple of other, I saw Vinit was talking about work. I saw Arvind opened about his work. There is something about the way you, uh, you have been. Uh, I think whatever it is really good. Thank you so much for making us feel that comfortable and feel we can ask you questions which possibly are personal to us. Uh, thank you for being kind. Uh, uh, before you go, uh, any one last tip? You know, the human mind is going to forget everything, right? It's an amazing <laughs> session. But is it one thing they're going to leave us uh, with? Well, I mean, one, I think, you know, what I hope is that after reading the book, the that it kind of rearranges people's mental furniture so they are less likely to overlook subtraction. Failing that, uh, like I think you can think about how do you put cues into your life to remind yourself to subtract in at the moment of the decision, right? Um, so like the, the equivalent of this, hey, you can add or subtract here. Um, and so when I'm making my to-do list for the week, I also force myself to do stop doings. And you know, what in your life can you kind of cue subtraction in? Um, and then also, you know. That's that's one thing, but the the goal is this kind of mindset shift. And I would I would add, you know, end on it. I don't. It's not impossible. This is not like one of those, uh, one of these biases that's like you know, impossible to change. It's it's just this is the way we're we're doing it. And I think by by understanding it, you're going to be able to be more likely to to use more of your options. So that's what I'd leave you with. And I, I really appreciate the uh, the compliment, Prakash. I would. Uh, I think it's, I would give the credit to you guys um, uh, and gals that like, this is, uh, you're my people. This is like who I enjoy talking to. And um, it's, uh, this is my favorite.
favorite part of the, the process is being able to kind of talk about, well, share what I know, but also kind of hear other people's perspectives on it. And, and it helps me kind of refine my thinking, right? Or subtract some of the things that, uh, that I used to think that I don't need to think anymore. So, so I really appreciate it. And uh, the, the last thing is, um, yeah, if, let me know if you uh, if there are other authors on your list that you're trying to get, because it, it would make me look good to reach out to people and be like, hey, you should go talk to this group from all over the world. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Lydie. Before you go, was was the author, uh, the researcher Adam Grant, the behavioral friction you're talking about? Alison has a question out here before you go, last week question. Was you got an email from a renowned uh, researcher. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Adam, and, yeah, no, so and, Bob Sutton was the, the Friction Project guy. Bob? Robert, yeah, I think he might go by Robert Sutton on the internet. Um, but All right. yeah. yeah, there you oh, go. Okay. Sandeep has got the Sandeep. link out there. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, uh, thank you all. Have a fantastic all. weekend ahead. Wear your mask. Be safe, everyone. Lady, absolute pleasure. Yeah, so much. thanks, everybody. See you all next week when we have yeah. Philippa, Roberts and Jane Cunningham to talk about brand splaining. Thank you so much, Lady. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>